in the last segment we talked about um, the poisson's ratio the lateral strain and the, the relationship between the lateral strain and the axial strain and everything now and then we also talked about what happens when a, a body is subjected to hydrostatic pressure sort of when sigma x sigma y sigma z all are you know um, uh, a pressure type okay same from all sides now there is another concept uh, which is called dilatation or dilatation means in fact you know um, increment in volume okay so something is dilated so 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 that means it it increased in volume but it's not necessary that uh, it should only be increased it if it, it is compressed also suppose in in the case of um, when you talked about you know uh, taking the body into water deep water so it, it gets compressed from all sides so that also is a call, um, process called dilatation but the value will be negative okay now uh, so 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 to now under the assumption that all our deflections or the deformations are small can we talk or can we get an expression to evaluate these or dilatation or uh, easily okay so that's the point so let's consider that you have you know a cube of unit length sides okay the sides are of unit length we are taking unit length so that whatever deformation that will come that will be the strain itself okay and then you imagine that um, the stresses sigma x sigma y are oh, sorry not in this direction this should be sigma z and maybe this is sigma y okay it's bad so this is sigma y now under these uh, action of these uh, stresses um, what will happen um, so this body will have all those strains right so so the, which we saw in the previous uh, segment how to calculate those strains uh, epsilon x y and z now but but with those changes what is the net change in volume okay or the rel uh, relative change in volume so that's what we are trying to in fact evaluate okay so now uh, because initially it was one unit length now uh, so so the first initial volume uh, initial uh, is one say meter cube or whatever okay doesn't matter one meter cube but then once you have applied these uh, stresses so v uh, final final will be what it will be say 1 plus epsilon x times 1 plus epsilon y times 1 plus epsilon z where you have calculated epsilon x y and z uh, in the, using the method uh, we discussed in the previous segment but then uh, see please note that these all epsilons they are very very small okay and uh, we can to to without compromising much um, in the uh, accuracy we can neglect uh, higher order terms which are higher in order than first order okay that means this one we can write that say one plus epsilon x plus epsilon y plus epsilon z plus all other terms which are of higher order uh, second and higher okay so third order ex ey ez that also we neglect and ex ey type of terms also we neglect okay so these things we simply neglect so what remains is this much okay so that means now what is the change in volume per unit volume or so so because that's why we took it from uh, unit volume so that this calculation will be straightforward and this delta v will be what this much only right because one is uh, getting cancer so a, a, and division also um, by one so you get epsilon x epsilon y epsilon z so this generally is denoted as the letter e so which is basically the dilatation 
Okay. Um, now, and then remember how to calculate e x, e y, epsilon x, y, and z uh, as per the previous segment. Now, coming to um, suppose we um, apply that uh, those you know um, values from the previous equation. So, what will be the total e? Okay. So you will have, so you will sum them up uh, if I have them in the previous, yeah. So you are basically summing them up. So sigma x, sigma y plus sigma z, okay. So sigma x plus sigma y plus sigma z over E minus what you have here. Then, yeah minus uh, what do you get sigma y and another sigma y is there somewhere yeah so two uh, each of them are twice there right so you will have minus two times new of sigma x plus sigma y plus sigma z over e which comes out to be if you take these things over E, take the thing common, so 1 minus 2 nu. Okay, that's fine. So this is your um, uh, dilatation or the relative change in volume when sigma x, sigma y and sigma z are applied. Okay, now you can go and uh, discuss the case where all of them are same and that to uh, suppose they are under hydrostatic pressure. So all sigma x, sigma y, sigma z are nothing but minus p. So what will happen here? So for that case, E will be, um, I'll write uh, say hydrostatic will be minus 3p over E times 1 minus 2 nu, right? So, so this is a relation which um, uh, you can also mm, write in a slightly different way. Uh, the way generally we write any modulus, for example, Young's modulus, mm, you write force or stress over strain, right? So the cause or, or the cause over uh, effect. For example, stiffness of a st spring, force over, over displacement. So here, if you think that pressure is, you know, a, a cause which is trying to compress something and this um, volumetric strain, okay? So this is like dilatation, change in volume per unit volume. So it's a volumetric strain. So pressure per volumetric strain, if you want to write, so you will have, say, pressure by hydrostatic, sorry, hydrostatic, um, you will get a negative of E over 1 minus 2 nu. In fact, um, If you define, you know, um, this this minus sign instead of putting it here, what we can do is, you know, increasing pressure decreases volume. So that minus sign, instead of putting it here, we can actually put it on other side, so that this we can define as, or or what we can do is, okay, we will define a constant, say k, is equal to the bulk modulus. Okay, which is negative of this is equal to negative of P over this E hydrostatic. Okay, so that will become equal to E over 1 minus 2 nu. Okay, so that means this also is another parameter which uh, can describe the material, which is a function of both Young's modulus and uh, the Poisson's ratio. And if you remember, um, uh, no, I didn't discuss that here uh, when I was discussing Poisson's ratio. 
um, I should have done that, but now I'll do that. See, the thing is, uh, generally students have a uh, um, feeling, intuition that uh, this Poisson's ratio is a consequence of either constancy of volume or constancy of mass or constancy of density something like that so they always feel that okay so so because something is getting elongated so obviously to keep the volume constant the other sides should get uh, be compressed but it's, it's it's not like that in fact it is a material property uh, which basically tells us that uh, how the molecular structure is arranged so that a force in one direction pulls the other molecules in the lateral direction. So it's it's a completely um, mat uh, material property which cannot be derived from either of the constancy of mass, volume or density. So please do not uh, think that any of them can be used to derive Poisson's ratio's value. It has to be measured because it's a material property. Okay, so I always give this example. For example, you know, uh, um, you have the CP and CV, the specific heat of constant volume and constant pressure. So th their properties, right? So you, uh, so so, uh, what does it tell you? It tells you that if you give some energy, any particular uh, gas or um, gaseous substance, how much of that it will distribute into in, in what type of thing so how much it tries to increase the volume and how much it tries to uh, increase the pressure so like that so uh, work done in temperature so so like that uh, and then it's that is also completely a material property right so you cannot derive that from anything else it has to measure so very similarly this thing also uh, the Poisson's ratio uh, is just a material property which needs to be measured and E also is a material property which needs to be measured and once you measure these two property you can calculate its bulk modulus okay but but please note that all the assumption which we used uh, they must be valid that the deformations are small and all those things otherwise these these equations will not be valid okay so we, we uh, um, neglected those second and third order terms in, in the expression in deriving this okay so that should always be kept in mind that under that assumption this relationship is valid one more point uh, or to notice is see um, when you apply pressure um, or else okay now just mathematically if you see this term can never go to zero right so uh, because then it will become infinite it just blow up so that means nu uh, should be below 0.5 okay so so it cannot go beyond 0.5 because in that case it will become negative the the bulk modulus will become negative that means you are compressing and the the material is actually expanding so that never happens usually um, and that is why it cannot go beyond 0.5 and 0.5 is the limit up to which it can uh, reach okay generally for materials it will be in the range of 0.2 to 0.35 or so um, so like that okay so so please note that new um, ranges uh, from it's below 0 0.5 and more than 0, 0.0 okay so this is the range in which the Poisson's ratio varies and this is the bulk modulus which you can write in terms of Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio yeah so that was about Poisson's ratio and dilatation so and in the next segment we will be talking uh, one more um, concept but slightly different uh, it will be about um, a question that does shear also um, uh, happen or is it present the shearing things are also present when we are applying only axial loading so that's the question which we will deal with in the next segment see you in the next segment.